what we would consider for us common knowledge is a completely different language to other individuals. We know that diet is the foundation of how we're gonna feel. And some people, well, a significant amount of people, they can't grasp that. Something for us that is small can be absolutely life altering for another individual. To just change a little bit could totally be a huge step for them. You have people that are coming in that don't understand that fat is healthy. So let's start there. And if you're in fight or flight mode, your cortisol levels are up, you're tense, mm -hmm. you're stressed, and your body, you know, we're so primal, your body's like, oh my gosh, a woolly mammoth is chasing me. Yet you're just upset you're at a red light. It is expensive, but without a doubt, I confidently say that it could be the most life-changing thing for someone to would be neurofeedback. When things are important enough for you, you will make time for it. You are listening to the Optimal Performance Podcast. The OPP is brought to you by Natural Stacks, makers of 100% natural and open source supplements designed to help you live optimal. For more information on how to build optimal mental and physical performance into your life, visit naturalstacks.com. Ryan Muncy is, is probably the smartest guy I know. Trust me, Muncy is the nutrition guy. Ryan Muncy's out there trying to make the world better for all of us. The Optimal Performance Podcast is bold, edgy, creative, entertaining, and epic. Ryan Muncy is my go-to guy. Ryan Muncy is he's the first guy I call. He's making people's lives better. Ryan Muncy's an innovator. All right, welcome back to the OPP. I'm your host, Ryan Muncy, joined today by Mr. Todd Shipman. Todd, thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you. So Todd is an ultra marathon runner, a bulletproof coach, a life wellness coach, and has recently been the subject of a men's health feature. We're going to talk to him a little bit about that and a little bit about a whole lot of different biohacking stuff some things that you guys will easily be able to implement right away into your life to experience results. Before we get to that, a couple of housekeeping notes. As always, go to naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to see the blog post for this along with links and uh, resources, links to all the articles or studies and things that we mentioned, books, products, whatever. Go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Let us know how much you like the show. If we read your review on the air, we will hook you up with free Natural Stacks products. And of course, share the OPP with the people in your life who you know will benefit from and enjoy the things that we're talking about. Uh, I know Todd's going to share a lot of tips with us today that will be helpful in your life, but also people that you know. Uh, so as you hear these things, if someone pops into your mind and you think, oh man, I wish so-and-so knew this, share the OPP, share this episode with them and let them know, you know, hey, here's the solution to whatever it is that you're dealing with or that thing I was trying to explain to you. Here it is. Um, so public service announcements are over. Todd, you ready to do this? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's start with the men's health thing. I think that's so cool. They're doing an article, a day in the life of a biohacker. Right. And out of all the biohackers out there, they chose you. Correct. Why you? I think it came from a suggestion of another individual who is kind of runs SF peak performance here, George Burke. And I think they'd reached out to him because he runs a biohacking meetup. And um, he had just sent me an email and said, hey, can these guys get a hold of you? So I never went further, but I'm assuming George said, hey, I know a guy because with George, I've, you know, discussed things with him and kind of, you know, just shared some knowledge with him. So I think uh, I left some kind of uh, image with him. So when they, they had a lot of questions for me as to what I did and I gave them my daily routine and they were just kind of like, oh, wow, wow. And you're a family man and have kids. Yeah, we want to follow you and, and see what you do. So. So, you know, a lot of times we say that like the best way to kind of, um, you know, remember some of the things that you've learned is, is to teach others. Um, in that process, you know, you said that, that it, it turned into being a lot of education from you for them. Uh, what were some of the things that, that were eye opening to you that maybe you would not have thought of as educational, but turned out to be big lessons for them? You know, I think. Uh, individuals that are in this lifestyle, you know, like functional wellness, a lot of things we take for granted. And it's just what we would consider for us common knowledge is a completely different language to other individuals, including 
the senior editor of Men's Health who had never had bulletproof coffee. And something as simple as that, which to us is we wake up and do it. There's not much of like thought process, right? And to them, it was a whole new experience. And the entire day was an experience experiencing the coffee because they're just like, wow, it's four o'clock. We haven't eaten. This is incredible. Like we're not hungry and we feel amazing, you know? And uh, just again, everything I think that we take for granted, uh, daily process, natural sunlight, uh, earthing, grounding, things that I just, I do and I will always make time for it are things they didn't even know, like they don't know exist. And that's why it was such a great opportunity to educate because you have these guys that are obviously into the health mindset and if this is still a new world for them. It's still an untapped market for them to pull information out and use it and teach their readers. And mm. I, I don't know how many subscribers they have, but they obviously have a large enough group that that could make a difference. Well, it certainly does. I mean, I think back to, you know, I first started lifting weights in high school and in large part because, you know, I was aware of men's health magazines and I wanted to look like the guys on the cover. And mm. my introduction into learning about health and fitness was men's health. I remember my grandmother bought me a subscription to that magazine for Christmas every year, uh, all through high school and college. And, uh, that was definitely my gateway into whatever you want to call this journey, health and fitness right. and whatever. And, you know, I still, we, we talk to a lot of people in health and fitness and, you know, there's, I don't know the right word, maybe animosity about what is in those magazines and how health and fitness is portrayed. Maybe not so much, yeah, in, men's, not so much in men's health, but I know like, especially in like the bodybuilding and, and more of like the strength training type magazines. Um, how do we get a lot of these things that maybe we take for granted or that we feel like everyone should know? How do we get that into, you know, more of that mainstream literature to help and, and, and get penetration into the big part of the bell curve? I would go with like the importance of networking and again, sharing this knowledge because once again, it's such a little vicinity yet right now where people don't even know it exists yet for us, it's our life. Yeah. And, and there's so many people in this in the paleo bubble or the bulletproof bubble or the keto bubble. And, and we, we like to immerse ourselves and, and we talk about it on the show, the importance of being in that community and surrounding yourself with like-minded people. But when we get in those bubbles, we forget that we're still only a small percentage of the world. And, right. you know, most 90% of the people out there haven't even heard of or, or experienced these things. Yeah. I mean, I still am constantly, you know, talking to people about coffee and it's like, how deep do you want me to go? <laughs> you know, like how important clean coffee and how much it can affect your day or diet. Like to us, we don't even think about it. We know that diet is the foundation of how we're going to feel. And some people, well, a significant amount of people, they can't grasp that. They don't understand why they had a burrito and they have a stomach ache. And it's, so set on them for eating, they don't put the two together. And it's, you know, it's like for us, it's, it's, it's right there in front of us. Right. But it's, it's getting these people educated with that knowledge so that they, they deserve to know. They deserve to know that mm -hmm. um, no matter what they do. And at least allow them the platform if they choose to learn about it. And I think that's for us, like we can live, you know, by example and people will come to you. Right? I mean, People come to you, right, Ryan? You're like, how do you do this? How are you so, you know, smart with this stuff? And how are you so fit? And you're leading by your results. And people will become interested in that. I get that. And a lot where it's like, well, how do you run so much, but you have three kids? Well, if you really want to listen, I'd love to share that with you. Instead of being like a religious freak, being like knocking on the door. It's like, excuse <laughs> me, do you have time to listen about the ketogenic diet and freaking people out? <laughs> <laughs> so... How do you balance that? Because I mean, I'm I'm incredibly passionate about this and getting the the word out. Obviously, the podcast gives me the the ability, the platform, the channel to do that. Somebody like you, I, I know how passionate you are, and you know we've we've we talked about this today. You know, for you guys listening, Todd uh, allowed me to kind of follow him around. Actually, he guided me around San Francisco all day today, and we climbed some trees. We did some swimming in cold water under the Golden Gate Bridge, and we had some great coffee and great food. Mission Heirloom 
is the restaurant in Berkeley. If you're in the area, check them out. It's great food, uh, all grass fed, no GMO. Um, but you know, my, my point is we, we've had some conversation up to this point today. And you know, one of the things you mentioned was having to sort of not come across as like you just said, sort of the creepy, the, the, yeah. the evangelist knocking door to door, you know, promoting whatever you think is your gospel or your canon. And, uh, it's not that you believe that it is that it's just that, you know, the power it has to help people. So how do you balance that? How do you, okay, I'm, I'm going to lead by example and let people come to me. But at the same time, like if you do that, if you take that completely passive approach, we're never going to get market penetration. We're never going to, uh, we're never going to reach the masses more than say the American heart association who is going to pour a bunch of money into certain reports to, you know, convince people to use vegetable oil. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's really because again, it's such this, my wife always tells me I need to calm down a little because someone will ask me a question and I'll just go off a whole, you know, if I could be talking and it's with the passion, I know they see that, but it's like, it can be very overwhelming because you get these people that are actively wanting to know and they want to live healthy lifestyles, but it's very intimidating. And my excitement that I personally have, I know can be overwhelming because I just want to vomit all my help, like information onto you as fast as possible, you know, and let's do this and that. And here's what you can do right now to change it. But then my wife says, she's like, yeah, step back, right? Because I do, I need to step back and look and say, is this too much for that individual to handle right now? Where are they in their life, mindset, and physically and environmentally? Mm -hmm. What are they capable of and what can be done right now for them to have the most effective changes? But to do broad would be a dream, right? A broad spectrum of people. Right. But that's the thing because science has just plugged it into individuals that they will believe the AHA over someone who actually has the scientific studies that were done blindly and legitimately, and they're like, no. And half the time you can be told that, and these people start like, no, I'm gonna eat my trans fat, or <laughs> I wanna keep with my canola oil, and you know, like to me, that's, a, that's literally just poison. Canola oil, right. all that stuff is poison. And it's like, how do we get people just to, just getting that out of their diets would make such a significant change for health for these individuals. Yet, you've got the AHA that's saying, take more of it in, take more of it in, and it's like, there's that article, it's, is the AHA a terrorist group? And like, that is hilarious of a title, right? Right. Because we're killing ourselves from the inside. But that's hilarious to me. Yeah. Like that, yeah. it's just like, call them a terrorist group, whatever you want. But like, I found that that article was be hilarious that that's what they're targeting the mass. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen that, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. So go to uh, naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to see the blog post for this and, and we'll have a link to that on there. So, and that, sort of leads into another thing that we were talking about today that, that I want to get your thoughts on on the air for our listeners, Todd. You know, everybody exists on a spectrum. And in today's world, we try to pinpoint where they are on that spectrum by putting them in a box. You know, are you this? Are you that? We put a label on people. And um, I'm reading, uh, recently read the book Originals. And there's um, a, a concept in the book. If you guys have not read it, check it out. Originals uh, by Adam Grant. There's a, a concept in the book, I believe it's horizontal hatred or horizontal something, but it, it has to do with, you know, people on different points of the spectrum within the same movement. Uh, for example, vegans may express more hatred towards a vegetarian than they would towards a carnivore or an omnivore, because in their mind, you know, as a vegan, they're, they're at the purest end of the spectrum and they find fault with the pragmatists, you know, the, mm. the vegetarian who, you know, sort of understands the, the concept is in, in, and is on board with the mission, but not all the way to that far end of the spectrum. So you see this infighting uh, among people in the same mission as opposed to education of the people outside of that. We see this in health and fitness. I know it's, it exists in fitness so much. I mean, you know, we see power lifters and crossfitters and strongmen infighting instead of focusing on you know, hey, 90% of what we do is we have in common and we want to be healthier. We want to move better. We want to be stronger. How do we educate people who are not active because we're more sedentary and less active and eat way too much, you know, compared to any other point in our history? Why don't we focus on 
just getting more people to be more active and eat better and healthier and stronger as opposed to worrying about exactly how they do it. So this, this concept of, of horizontal hatred, um, you know, how do you, how do you see us kind of stopping that within our communities? You know, the, the keto versus paleo versus bulletproof versus, uh, primal or move nat. Um, how do we get past those differences and make the mission bigger and, and move forward as one? It baffles me, you know, because you, you, what you speak is complete truth. We're half ketogenic or grain fed, but ketogenic or, you know, the purest. And it's like we are a very small movement in reality compared to the rest of the population. And why would we not want to work together? Because at the end of the day, I feel we all care about the same thing, which the same thing I said is functional wellness, right? And cognitive performance and physical performance. And why can we not just have that shit common and go from there? Because if you have an internal conflict from the outside, that looks worse, right? That's right. like a new gang or something coming out and all of a sudden the gang leaders are fighting over it. And you look at that, it's, that's no good. Their foundation isn't solid. And, you know, it's, I believe, and with the people that I work with currently is, that you get to celebrate every change someone does. Because something for us that is small can be absolutely life-altering for another individual. To just change a little bit could totally be a huge step for them. Like it, removing vegetable oil from their diet. Yeah, or just soda, Ryan. Right. I mean, come on, yeah. people, it's easy to drink six to 10 a day and that's a big deal. And that's awesome. If someone makes that decision to say, I'm going to stop drinking soda, like that excites me. You know, yeah. I literally get, <laughs> you know, my hair comes up because it's like, that's awesome. Yeah. And now someone else might be like, well, that's nothing compared to the rest you can do, which is true. But for that individual, that's awesome. Yeah. And if you do not celebrate that jump with them, they're not going to feel like they have any progress and they haven't made achievements. So work with them on everything and don't pressure them. But that change is big for them. It's real for them. Let's celebrate it. And that celebration makes it easier for them to feel welcomed into yeah. our community. Because you have to admit, from the outside, for that person who still drinks soda, the idea of you know shooting oxygen and, and red light up their nostrils while they're doing coffee enemas and you know who knows what else, that's, there's a huge barrier there it looks like an insurmountable thing to get from where they are to feeling like they have to do all mm. of this to be part of the club. That's very intimidating. Right. It is because it's for us, that's a different rabbit hole. We can go over every subject, right? I know that I've spent just a crazy amount of nights, right? Reading just about red light therapy. And then that will take me to some other, you know, technology. And then I could spend, nights on that and then i'm like okay well let me focus now on cold therapy and the same thing right so right. it's like as much as we've invested our time we, which has been a lot you have people that are coming in that don't understand that fat is healthy so let's start there let's start with basics and when they're ready for more and if you have celebrated them properly if you have motivated them they will come asking for more what's next that's how i started yeah. for the most part was like yeah. what's next okay, I've done this, what's next? And it's just, they are in control and you're there to guide them. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of flows. It's not forced on them. They are excited themselves. And that, you, know, you can't create the motivation. You're going to force the person. But if they can get it themselves, it's super organic. It's exciting. It's funny. I, I had a mentor once who asked me, he said, do you think you can go out on the street and get any person on the street motivated to lose weight? And I was young and I said, yeah, I think I can. And he was like, you're, you're full of shit. You can't, um, you know, and he went on and explained why. And, you know, if, if anybody doesn't believe that, just go out on the street and try to do it. But it's exactly like you just said. I mean, you, all you can do is be there and be ready when someone makes a decision to say, this is now my priority. This is what I want to do. I want to become healthier now. How do I do it? But we can't force that on them. And, and sometimes it takes them to hit rock bottom. Right. It really does. Um, I have pushed things with my mother for quite some time about eating healthier. Um, 
and it took her being diagnosed with diabetes type 2. And then from there, she said, let's talk. Because you know what the diabetic nutritionist told her? <laughs> I do, because that's what I have an undergraduate degree in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they said, eat margarine, diet soda, canola oil, vegetable oil. Mm. And that just made my heart drop. Yeah. And, and, and reduce your carbohydrate intake from 60% of your total calories all the way down to a whopping 50%. Yeah, it's really like when yeah. it's really just amazing. And so she took trust in my advice mm -hmm. and she reversed her diagnosis in six weeks. She lost, I believe, a total of almost 40 pounds in that six weeks. Yeah. And it was easy for her because when she started losing weight, she saw it. And then it was effortless again to motivate, right? And her brain was working better. She talks about her memory being better and just feeling better in general, being able to be more mobile and flexible. And you know, it's like that hits home. Obviously, that's my mother, you right, know, and right. for her to come to me, I remember I was literally talking to her. And I had to apologize over the phone. And I was crying. <laughs> she doesn't know that. But I was crying because I'm like, I have so much I want to tell you. And I'm sorry this is overwhelming. But I'm so excited for you yeah. that we can now move this direction. And that you came to me. I didn't have to because I tried to force it. Right. I've I brought in, you know, nudged it and it didn't work. When she came to me, she was ready. She made the commitment and she stayed committed. Mm -hmm. And then life changing for her. Beautiful. I think a lot of us can relate to that where any of us who have any level of knowledge and, and passion for this, there are people in our family that we want to pull up with us, mm -hmm. but we can't unless they're ready. And it is so amazing when they say, okay, I'm ready. And they come to you and they're like, all right, what do I need to do? I know you have the answers and I'm ready. Tell me what to do. So let's talk about maybe three or four of the hacks or strategies that you would consider the biggest bang for your buck and specifically bang, bang for your buck, not just in terms of time investment, but also financial, because, you know, we see a lot of these, um, you know, biohackers that have, you know, $7,000 oxygen machines or, you know, $10,000 coffee makers or, you know, things that the average person is not going to have in their home. Right. So if I say, you know, what's your best tool and it's something that's out of reach for most people, um, then Push that doesn't, that doesn't really do people any good. Right. So, right. so give us, you know, your three or four that are biggest bang for your buck. As easy as that seems to answer, right? Like I can answer that really easy. And I think it, it goes into everyone's genetics. It goes to where they live. Where are they at in life? What is their goals? Um, that being said, I'd like to present a little more if that's okay. Sure. Like I think something that would be free that you could start tonight and have completely different morning experience if you did it tonight, uh, which are accessible to anyone. And those biohacks would be Wim Hof breathing method, cold showers, or jump into a water, whether it's just for 90 seconds, or even a face plunge, take a bowl of ice, mm -hmm. put your face in it, just do it for 10 seconds, and you're gonna feel amazing. My wife had a crazy headache from jet lag yesterday. She did that, and it was gone within a few, you know, a minute afterwards. Uh, and then just walking around barefoot, uh, natural movement kind of stuff. Go to the park, walk around barefoot with your shirt off if that's possible, or just having more skin exposed. Those are the three that I think everyone can do and everyone could benefit from instantly. Those aren't things that you have to wait a few days to feel a difference. You're going to get that right away, and there's, there's no cost to that. Mm -hmm. um, then going into things that would cost money. Uh, for me, my go-to is my red light therapy panel. I have the, Le uh, you know, the Leanne Vignes, um light panel. That's my personal favorite. It shows it's got far infrared, near infrared, and middle. It uses all the spectrum and the benefits are literally countless. <laughs> yeah. So let's, we'll pause and, and kind of recap on some of this, but I, I do, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that the two of the free ones that you mentioned um, are two of the five things that I mentioned on a, a solo cast that we did recently. If you guys haven't heard that one, I think it was 115, but it was five science backed ways to increase happiness. And they included moving more and, and getting outdoors more. Um, you know, so it's, it's really cool to hear, you know, that from a different perspective, but talking about the red light therapy, we did a, an episode way, way back. It was maybe in the fifties with Dr. Raleigh Duncan from clear light saunas. And he talked about near mid and, and far infrared 
But give us just a recap on the difference between those three in case people didn't hear that one, which is a hint. Go back and listen. It was a good <laughs> one. Um, but if people aren't familiar with the differences there, kind of fill in the gap for us. Yeah, so the near-infrared you can use as a panel. Uh, it's also become very popular in a sauna. Uh, now, the near-infrared is actually what penetrates further into your skin. Uh, it's going to help with you know any kind of blood circulation. You're going to get injury. You're going to detox yourself. I'm sorry. Well, it helps recover from injury, just to be clear on that. Right. Uh, and again, it heats your body from the inside out. So it helps with the detox. Um, now, the far infrared is more on the outside. So it gets blood flow there. It also helps you know mitochondria function, ATP, as well as like so if you have scars and stuff, mm -hmm. because you're getting blood to that area. Middle, I think it's just the middle spectrum as far as what it does. You get a and, little bit of both, yeah, but, but not to the I don't personally extent. know the signi like because the only thing I have of middle is the light panel, mm -hmm. and Leanne knows she's probably one of the top knowing people, so I will just trust her on that. I've never looked at it, but as far as like um, far infrared is great, but I you know I I have a near infrared sauna that I use daily, sometimes twice too, so. The importance of near infrared is also one of my. Do so you have a sauna in the house? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I have what they call a sauna fix. So you sit in it, and it's got four spots. And you, it's a fully enclosed, so it's not even just the chest down. It's fully enclosed. You can kind of move it around too, so it's not one of those big wooden ones. And that thing is amazing because once again, it heats you from the inside out, not like a normal sauna where it's outside. It just changes right. a lot of stuff, you know, as far as benefits. So nice, and that's called a sauna fix. Sauna fix. All right, cool. So for you guys listening, go to naturalstacks.com for the blog post. I will make sure Todd gives me links to all of this stuff, and we'll have links for it for you guys to uh, check any of these things out if you want to. Uh, so the first of your three big for your big bang for your buck that costs money is red light. What would be two and three? I think for number two, I think for like long-term health benefits would be like an HRV system. Now you can go and get the inner balance, which is what I use. It's, I believe it's $140. Uh, you can buy it on the Bulletproof website that I know of. That's where I bought it, but you can, I'm sure you can get anywhere. It's called heart math and it's mm -hmm. inner balance. You hook it up to your, your phone, you hook it up then up to your ear and it gives you instant feedback of your heart rate variability. And the more I use it, the more you, I realize the importance because what it's doing is it's keeping you out of fight or flight. And if you kind of are mindful for your day, think about how many times you go into fight or flight. For me, if I'm mindful, I do it a lot still. Otherwise, I don't even notice. But just driving through the city, I go into fight or flight mode. Right. I notice my heart rate going up. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start breathing. I'm going to focus. I'm going to train the heart rate variability. And it just changes your, your perspective in that moment. You become more calm, more acceptance and not so reactive so once again if you're in fight or flight mode your cortisol levels are up you're tense mm -hmm. you're stressed and your body you know we're so primal your body's like oh my gosh a woolly mammoth is chasing you yet you're just upset you're at a red light yeah the reality right right instead your body's like oh my gosh you need energy so you're gonna start craving sugar it, that's why heart rate variability goes so far with its benefits because it's not just one thing, it goes because once again, the stress you have is just a domino effect for the rest of the day of irritability, moodiness kind of stuff, your focus. I think a lot of that heart rate variability is, is it's talked about a lot, but what I think what we lack is education from a, from a consumer standpoint. Yeah. Like we hear about, oh, well, this is an app that I should have or a metric that I should be tracking, data that I should be looking at, but I don't know how to interpret it. I don't know mm -hmm. what to do with it. Where could listeners go to get more of that or, or give them a crash course into like, you know, this is the number to look at. This is what it means. This is what you do with that data. Very lucky, at least to be um, we're going through the Bulletproof Coach certification. We spend a good amount of time learning about HRV and the importance, especially for clients, because it really is. It just changes your whole day. Uh, now, HRV, heart uh, math variability, or heart math will do a certification for individuals. So there's actual coaches that you can go to. I have a friend, Brian Johnson. And he is certified, and he coaches this for like professional triathletes and stuff, and the importance of HRV for their long-term performance. And so he's the kind of individual that you do it, and you can do it at your house, and he can up, you can upload all the information to his computer, and then he can read everything and interpret it. So, And ideally what you just want, because you know you, when you're doing it, you're watching it, it's, it's 
analyzing, you know, the, the time difference between each heartbeat and separation between that, and it's showing it to you. And you want to keep it as rhythmic as possible. And the second it goes off, it gives you that instant feedback to, hey, slow down your breathing, close your eyes, breathe from your lungs, breathe through your focus on your heart. And it's, it teaches you it, right there, you know. So and that's just an app. So that's an app that teaches you the breathing that increases HRV. Yeah. And there's not a specific breathing. It's just your breathing. It's going to watch what you're doing. It's mm -hmm. pretty much like, you know, breathing from the heart. Mm -hmm. Close your eyes. Imagine your heart focus in and out, you know, and that's when you're going to start seeing results. And it'll tell you that. So it's not like there is this is the way to breathe. Right. It's it's instant feedback. It's biofeedback for you right in that moment to how to change your breathing. And breathing is just once it, I mean, obviously it's an involuntary motor form, right? Like we right. do it regardless. But it's like if you're mindful on how you breathe, it's crazy how much our breathing changes. I one thing I always tell people to do is. Just be mindful next time you go to your front door and unlock your door. Most everyone I know holds their breath while you put the key in and unlock your door, right? And that sends a lot of triggers to your body. It's, okay, something's going on, something's weird, why am I holding my breath? And to us, we're just, again, at the front door, but our body doesn't know what's going on. So that triggers different things. And, you know, going from calm breathing to heavy breathing changes just, you know, our actual chemical makeup in our body and it's like mm -hmm. breathing is probably the most important thing we can do and you need to be aware of how you're breathing so stop every hour whether you need to set an alarm for every 30 minutes see how you're breathing you know um there's like called a bolt breathing mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure if you know what that is but it's it's breathing right and so it's a good thing is just to hold your breath stop one minute every like everyone's all to stop your and hold, how long can you hold your breath just with effortless thinking it's like you should be at least be able to hold your breath for 20 seconds and if you're not doesn't mean anything, but focus on your breathing for a bit because that'll change it. And it just means you're not breathing properly or efficiently that your body wants it. So that's a good way to do it. Just stop, hold your breath, however long you can hold it for. Right. So yeah, breathing is, you know, being able to have that mindful breathing, which the HRV <laughs> really makes you right. quantify, you right. know, your results. And you know right then and there, okay, I can change my breathing. I'm have a better day. So this, the, the heart math and the clipping it to your earlobe allows you to basically be able to look at your HRV at any point during the day. Yeah, instantly. Without, uh, I, I know most commonly we hear about HRV with either a heart rate um, strap or like a finger right. sensor or something. Yeah, like the old like so, polar chest yeah. things or Garmin ones. Yeah. yeah, and this is great. You can, yeah. I hook it up to my iPod. Yeah. iPad, sorry. <laughs> I hook it up to my iPad or my iPhone and mm -hmm. just kind of, I can go with it wherever I want and use it. And cool. Cool. It's simple. All right. So what would be number three? Yeah, number three. It is expensive, but without a doubt, I confidently say that it could be the most life-changing thing for someone to would be neurofeedback. I purchased a machine and I rent it out to people locally and I've shipped it out to people because I believe, of course, there's people here, there's companies that can charge you $200 a session. When you pay that amount for like a NeuroOptimal, it turns out to like $20 a session. So I will rent it out at that price. I don't do a profit. I do it to people because I care enough about the changes that neurofeedback gives to people. So mm -hmm. uh, for me, it really helped with any kind of ADD. I used to read. I could get through like three pages and then be like, what did I read? I don't remember because I had 20 different conversations going on in the back. Uh, the focus wasn't there. Um, mild anxiety and just impulsive purchasing and stuff like that, you know, it would be like, oh, I want this, I'm going to buy it. And that stuff significantly, I noticed, were quick changes, like with neurofeedback. When you say and quick, how long did it take to notice changes in behavior? Five to seven days was very noticeable for wow. me, for sure. Um, yeah. Now, they always tell you that you should do at least 20 to 30 sessions. Yeah. So imagine a doctor telling you $250 a session, you need 30. Okay, you're going to go take a personal loan out for that? Or what are you going to do? Right. Like That becomes not fair to individuals that, right. because autistic individuals have huge benefits to neurofeedback. Just depression, TBIs, seizures, things like that are all, have people that have been doing that. Man, veterans. Veterans, mm -hmm. every veteran that has been to any kind of, any kind of emotional trauma, whether it was war or not, I feel they deserve more than deserve the opportunity for neurofeedback because it, 
in case you know, in case people don't understand what neurofeedback is, I'm gonna put a very a very simple complex of what it is, is it resets your central nervous system. It resets the way your brain communicates with it. So things like for someone who hears a large boom and they cringe. Now neurofeedback obviously is not gonna take care of the actual experience that happened with that individual, but it will help with the automatic response that you get. So again, it doesn't help with that experience, but right. it will help with their response that they have when they hear something, the brain won't trigger the central nervous system to just react. And I think, obviously, I don't think, I know, like, they just deserve that. And it's crazy to me that, you know, that it's not at every VA. It's technology that's been around since the 50s, where they, they, they was basically created for individuals that had, like, grand mal seizures. Mm -hmm. And they, I, I'm a little off on the numbers, but I believe it was about 250 participants. And over 220 of them, within 90 days, were able to get their license back because they did not have any seizures amazing technology and then big pharma came in and said we are burying this technology and it's not allowed to be used and they took all the funding out of the people that researched they said if you keep researching this we will lose all of our funding and that was in the 50s we're talking 2017 this technology has been around wow and it's unbelievable for you guys listening if you want to deep dive on neurofeedback we We've actually covered it on two other episodes previously, once with Dr. Andrew Hill, who is a neuroscientist, runs Peak Brain Institute, and he hooked my brain up. We did a QEEG and, and talked about all, all that. I do not remember the number on those episodes, but look for Dr. Andrew Hill. Uh, and then there was another episode somewhere, I think neurofeedback is in the title of it. Definitely check those out. And if you go to the blog post for this, I will find them and put links to them directly uh, for you guys. So. Those are your, your big three. Um, yeah. Let's, I know movement is a big thing for you too. So let's talk about uh, MoveNet and, and some of the primal movement type stuff that you do. Uh, it's, it's very uncommon that we find someone, uh, you know, inside our bubble who kind of spans the different sects, if right. you will. You know, you, you can talk quantum biology with a Jack Cruz. You can talk bulletproof stuff obviously you're a bulletproof coach uh you can also you know do primal movement with you know the best of all the paleo people so let's get into that movement side of things and talk about you know your affinity for natural movement yeah i, I think that also goes back to like the purist right because um the other day someone tagged me in a conversation where uh, our uh, mutual friend james had posted about talking rewilding you know his ancestral movement stuff and biohacking with Ben Greenfield and someone made the comment on it was just a really negative comment about how are you how can you rewild and put biohacking together like how do they mix it's not possible you know and it's like a word of negative feelings towards each yeah. other's because yeah. they are both on the opposite spectrum but why can't we use both like but they're both focused on helping people improve their lives right why is that ever a bad thing it's nutritious movement and then it's nutritious technology right like you can do both. And to me, they satiate both sides for me. So with my biohacking, of course, it's, you know, maybe more acute problems mm -hmm. I'm having, mm -hmm. uh, situations. Like I know that I can go to biohacking for that. If I have an instant pain, I'm gonna go use my, my red light therapy or whatever it be. But rewilding slash natural movement, earth and grounding, it, it really feeds all of our just primal selves and you know like and i don't know about you but like when we were out climbing the trees you know i said like, we just play a game just follow the leader it's not a challenge it's just to build this part of our brain of creativity that mm -hmm. I, will, I let's just say later elementary school to middle school became uncool mm -hmm. to go swing on the monkey bars and they were so fun as a kid but then it's uncool well and even with monkey bars like it, there's almost this predetermined course that you follow yeah if you're gonna go yeah. play on a playground it's it's still linear <laughs> right like it's yeah. it's this this is what you go do and 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 on the trees it's you have to pick your own path and and no two people are going to pick the same exact path no we it, did that i watched right? you when i did and what you found to be efficient in your route was sometimes opposite of what i did and there's no right or wrong right 
it's just flexing and using parts of our brain for creativity, imagination, and what's fun. And I had a smile the whole time. I was like, this is yeah. this is fun, you know, because right. again, you're just you're being a child and it's okay. It's fun. It really triggers a lot of stuff in your body to just be like, oh, this is playful. You start using parts of your body for senses that you don't normally every day. You're having your fingers on the tree. It's on the bark. It's on the moss. You're feeling things. You're touching things that are sending senses and they're stimulating us. It's exciting. It's happy, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, you have your balance. And sometimes you have some adrenaline, right? You get a little high and you're like, oh, whoa, like, what if I fell? And it's exciting. You're still safe. If you choose to be, you can go up higher, but it's such a playful thing. And I, mean, I hope there's really no argument that being playful and the mindset that you create, right? The serotonin, right. oxytocin, everything that just flows out of that. It's got to be, you got to feel good. So for our people listening, you know, if they don't have access to the perfect trees for climbing, what are some ways that they can incorporate, you know, the benefits of this without climbing trees? That's a good question. Um, so for me, I still majority, I, I do playgrounds. I have three daughters and I love going to the park because I will create, I don't, you don't have, like Brandon, as a kid, you look at a playground as a linear thing. You do up and back, up and down, up and down the slide. Well, I turn it into whatever I want. I climb up whatever, I climb up one pole to get up to the top instead of using the stairs. Swing from things, I do rolling and there's always grass. So I can go do some animal movement, some fun things there, but you know, my I originally started MoveNat. I started training MoveNat just to specifically kind of connect with my kids. Like I saw what it was, and I was like, "Wow!" Because I you watch on YouTube, you see a lot of individuals go to a playground, and I was like, "Okay, that's cool." And so I'm at the park with my kids. I'm not there to let them have fun, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm not there to let them just do whatever they want and well, I you, sit around doing right, nothing. Right. I'm there to interact with them, to teach them, to show them different ways than just go up and down the slide. Up, you know, It's like, okay, what can we turn this into and hop over it and jump off it and roll into the bark? Like, I interact with them, I show them things and that's where I find the fun. I love going in the back and let's just make things up. Let's hop like an eagle. Let's crawl like a hippopotamus. And the kids are giddy. They love it. They love to get on me as a horse and play around. And I'm triggered by the happiness. They're triggered. They're connecting with their parents. And that's where I kind of joined in on it because really through MoveNet, I, I really developed creativity again and imagination that I was lacking. Because again, at some point in school, it becomes uncool. I had lost that. Mm -hmm. So going back and then trees are just an extra benefit because especially for like us adults, it's very primal to get up there and just climb and swing and jump. So and at the same time, you're just, it goes into grounding. You know, you're touching mm -hmm. a tree and you're barefoot. Well, we were barefoot. You know, you're just wrapping around all those, the negative ions and it's healthy for you. Right, and, right. Now, this is, it's an element of fitness that, isn't easily quantifiable and yeah. i think a lot of people who do it intentionally don't quantify it how do you draw the line you know you do so many different sorts of biohacks you know where do you draw the line where do you say okay i'm going to quantify this thing but i'm not going to quantify this thing maybe counting calories or tracking steps or you know, but then when it's red light exposure, maybe we're doing that on a certain time interval. How do you know for yourself? Like, where do you draw that distinction? What should be quantified and what shouldn't be? I think when it loses, it's fun. And then if it's a have to versus a get to. Um, and just like with natural movement, it's purely just an N equals one. I don't, I mean, how do you really, right. besides I can say, hey, my anxiety has gone down. I'm happier. There's, there are things that you can say to yourself, but quantifying it, it's not that important to me because I feel the difference right away. I don't need, I don't feel the need to, you know, write down the results. I mean, having in my head make, oh, hey, you know, I feel great afterwards. I'm happy. Um, and same thing where I think there are certain things that all of us can almost unnoticeably become obsessive about. Uh, we were talking about like the ketone strips, right? Mm -hmm. And like I was finding myself testing before and after, before and after. 
uh, weighing myself multiple times a day just to get the numbers and to see, you know. And even though it was fascinating, at some point it could become unhealthy. And I'm like, where, how do I acknowledge that it's unhealthy that I'm weighing myself so much? And at the point, my intention is this is cool. Right. Let me see how much I change throughout the day. But I could fall into a hole without knowing it, that all of a sudden this is an obsession that's unhealthy. Um, and I think that comes with quantifying it with anything. It's what's, what's your end result? Do you need to have it quantified in reason, or do you just want to feel better and you can kind of check in with yourself and see how you feel? But there's certain things, of course, like ketone, like you know, testing your, your ketosis. I mean, at some point you almost can, you can just tell how you feel. I've gotten to the point where I'm like, I bet I'm at a 2.2. I'm sure I'm 1.7, you know, and I got that way with running where I could just, I wore a heart rate, my, so long a heart rate meter that I, once I took it off, I could just tell you what my heart rate was because you use it so much. And it's like, that's not, that's pointless. I don't need it. And right. I, I feel where I'm at and I could tell you within a very close range where I was at. And same thing with ketosis once you get used to it. But yeah, that's always been my stance on the quantifying stuff. I, I see the value in measuring, especially when it's a new habit, uh, you know, keep a food log. I think anybody who is beginning a food or, or diet, uh, whatever you want to call it, journey, start with a food log so you're aware of what's going in because most people are not aware at all. Um, and how you feel afterwards, yeah. right? It's and, like... and, you know, whether it's, you know, I did the ketosis uh, experiment for eight months last year and, and I got the strips and I tested and I measured, um, but I never wanted those things to be things that I did forever. I didn't want to do the quantification, the metrics all the time. I don't want to live by a number. So for me, it was always just like you said, where you're, you're learning what the subjective experience feels like that matches an objective quantifiable mm -hmm. number so that at some point you can leave those measuring tools behind and just check in and say, you know, how do I feel? Where am I? Um, all right, let's, let's go one more big question. You know, you are an endurance athlete. You run 150, 100, 200 mile races regularly. You've got one coming up. Uh, Next February will be my big long run. Yeah, okay, for sure. I've taken a little bit of a break while I've been getting all my certifications and can going through the NTP and Bulletproof, and that's kind of right. I've kind of taken this year off because I've done it for so long. And but long you're coming back with a 200 miler, right? 135, 135 mile okay. will be in Minnesota and zero degree temperatures and. Right. Okay. So 135 <laughs> uh, miles in Minnesota in February, zero degrees and how, below. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. do you how do you balance all this? I mean, you just said it. You're you're a father. Uh, you have three daughters. Yeah, three uh, daughters. Uh, you're married. You have a job. Like I have a dog. You have a dog. Like you're you're a normal dude. Like you're not you're not a professional endurance athlete. You're not a professional biohacker. How do you fit all this stuff in so that no one thing occupies more than its fair share of your life, you know, and you can be there for, I'm assuming the most important people are the four women in your house. Yeah, I think, and that's one reason I just said I've taken this year off from running because it, it obviously takes up a lot of time because it'd be weekends of running 50 miles for a training run. And that's really where I got into biohacking unknowingly was figuring out how do I do all this? How do I put everything on the plate, the piece of pie, and keep everything balanced. Uh, my wife has been beyond supportive of that stuff, you know, and she knows that something's important. She wants me to go at it. And so it's not where I have to like, oh my gosh, am I giving her enough attention or whatever? Like that happens. But I know for her, it's like, I want you to do what you love and it's important. It makes her happy that I do that. And like I said, that's why I took this year off because my kids were at the age where they're starting soccer, swimming, and just extracurricular activities that I wanted to really focus on. With our oldest daughter, who's 10, there were some times, of course, where she had soccer and I, I had to make the decision on if I'm gonna go run 50 miles today that I need to train for, or am I gonna go get to celebrate her and her accomplishments, you know? And I didn't like that. So kind of where I got with that, of course, is especially when the, I have twins, they're four and a half, well, almost be five, but, um, was learning the efficiency of training and the efficiency of recovery. And when you start digging deep into that, you kind of just move yourself into what you would be considering biohacking, mm -hmm. right? Cold water therapy for fast recovery. Okay, I'm out in Yosemite. I just ran, you know, 40 miles. I'm gonna go r jump into Lake, the Tenaya Lake. 
great way to recover. So the next day I can go back out and run another 30 miles while I'm out there. Um, things that, that it almost just came unnoticeable. And I'm like, oh, this is what people are calling biohacking because high intensity interval training, right? Like that's the most effective way. And then it goes into mental conversations and just when things are important enough for you, you will make time for it, right? And there's a way to balance everything and make everyone happy. And again, my, my, my family were very busy, which most families are, but people to us will come to us and that's how we know we're doing it right because they go, how do you have time to do all this? It's like, well, it's important. We make the time, we do this, we'll figure it out. But with the endurance running, yes. I, there was in 2014, I spent every single weekend away. I was in Tahoe or Yosemite every single weekend training for the Tahoe 200 mile run. I needed to be at high altitude. I needed similar trails. And that took a toll on me. It took a toll on my wife being gone every Friday night to Sunday night. And that's when it really became, okay, how do I make this more efficient and more effective? So I even started running just in the middle of the night. I'd wait for everyone to go to sleep and I'd go run from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Then everyone's asleep, they wouldn't know. And then I'm losing sleep, you know. So it's, it's definitely an experiment that's constantly changing. And definitely the running's the easy part. <laughs> There's much more challenges to these ultra marathons and the running literally is the easiest part. When we were in the water, you gave me one of the ways that you get through some of those mental barriers. Uh, give us a couple of the, the things that you use to get through the hard part that is not running. Yeah, it's, uh, well, you mean the hard part as far as the mental? So right, like, right. It's, it's kind of always known, especially if you're in a marathon, it's like mile 18 is the wall you hit. And you know, it's obviously, there's a lot of science behind that. It's when your glucose levels hit the lowest and that. And when you're running these ultra marathons, so you're running anywhere from 20 hours to 48 hours or 72 hours straight, you're gonna hit 20 walls. And you really, from my experience, it comes that they're all mental. Because if you're told you're gonna hit a wall at 18 miles, your body is just gonna happen. And that's where the importance of mental conversation comes in. Uh, I have, like after the years and years of doing this, I have a very set playlist of, I know that at certain miles in a hundred mile race, I'm gonna just want nothing more than to quit. I'll find every reason to quit, whatever it be, whether it's an injury or something. And I've come to realize the power of just music. Uh, you know, I said Taylor Swift, Justin Bieber, Carly Jepsen, Sonella, or Selena Gomez, like the cheesiest funny music I can get because when I start listening to it, it completely changes my mindset. It makes my energy levels come back up. And then just within time, I'm like, that's crazy that I wanted to quit when now I'm having such a runner's high that you look at a cloud, you're like, that cloud is just so beautiful. And, and you to be clear, eye. those aren't regulars on your playlist. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, as my wife, I'm much more of a little Wayne and, <laughs> and those kind of, you know, which is obviously, you know, right. that's my, that's my biohacking music, my focus music. But gotcha. yeah, it's just music that makes you giggle. And yeah. you realize when you're in this race, if I start thinking I'm bored, if I start thinking I'm tired, the rest of my body is going to listen to that and it's going to act accordingly. So if I'm tired, all of a sudden I start feeling it. But if I, I have learned, I run and I talk to myself. I am doing great, Todd. I'm doing awesome. You see, I, I just have so much energy and I, I'm saying this to myself. Yeah. And it changes And you start it. to believe it, right. Yeah, because yeah. way too many times I've said, man, my heart, my hamstring is getting tight. Man, this hill sucks. Oh my gosh, it's 120 degrees. Why am I out here when I could be at home having ice cream with my daughters? And then it just down falls from there. And yeah. it's, it's I, I mean, there's no doubt. That well, that's, that's something else that we talked about earlier today too, is I mean, we're, we're wired to sort of look for what's wrong. Uh, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, it, it kept us alive. But yeah. we do have to stop that negative self-talk and, you know, sort of the, the looking for what's wrong. How, what are, what's one other way that you help yourself get through those grueling, possibly boring uh, adventures <laughs> at yeah. times? Boring. In all honesty, they can be very boring. Yeah, because it's very redundant movement. You are running for 30 plus hours. It, there's not, you know, besides the landscape, that's it. Um, Wim Hof breathing, which I can do at aid stations, mm -hmm. is huge for negative conversation, right? Because the blood can leave the, pre the prefrontal cortex and you're no longer having those negative conversations. Um, 
just picturing my kids. I mean, just like any parent though, you're, I mean, your motivation, your world changes when you have kids, man. And I can just picture them at aid stations and it changes everything again. And like, I'm doing this, like, you gotta think about like why, the the why, right? Yeah. And that's always, if you don't have a strong enough why, something's gonna happen. And for me, it's very, very important that I can look back and I can look at my daughters and say, you can do anything you want. Why? Because let me show you what I did. Not just a, oh, hey, you can do it. Let me show you my experiences. Let me show you that I did this and that you too can do anything you want in this world if you put the time and commitment into it. So like I'm living that example and that's become my why mm -hmm. that makes me have bigger goals. Yeah. You know, and it's like, what else can I do? Like, I just want to show them that anything is possible. I want them to know that. What else are you looking at? What's, what's beyond the 135 and zero degree temperature? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the big race, which is the opposite. So the cold, the, the, it's, I love the cold. The colder, the better. I've done races where, you know, 75% of the, of the entrants have dropped out because of the cold. Well, I'm all smiles, you know. I'm like, I'm loving this weather. But uh, the bad water in Death Valley is the ultimate endurance race in the world where at midnight it's 130 degrees you know and you're on a pavement that's like 240 degrees melts your shoes like that's the challenge because to me the heat is my biggest challenge mm -hmm. i've spent so much of my life in super extreme cold conditions that that's a comfort level which once again doing the arrowhead 135 that'd be but like you know the bad water 135 is pretty much the ultimate endurance challenge that you can do because that for me is everything I'm against, whether like you're running through Death Valley, you start at the bottom of Badwater and you run to Mount Whitney. Oh. So we got to talk about this because I made a mental note earlier today and I have not asked you this yet, but you've run a race previously in extreme heat mm. and your prep got you kicked out of a 24 hour fitness. Yeah. Why did you get kicked out of a 24 hour fitness? <laughs> well, that was arrogant, Todd, <laughs> I guess, where I said, you guys don't know me. I'm not a normal individual. You can't tell me, you know, I was more offended. I became offended by the fact, but what I was doing is I would, to train for this race, um, it's just a bad water event, which are always the most difficult endurance races there are, um, where, yeah, it's 120, 125 degrees in the day. So I'm training, I'm spending two to three hours in a sauna and I'm doing the cardio. I'm running. I'm you know in doing the sauna. In the sauna. And at this very specific one, they freaked out and said, "You can't do this anymore. If we see you, you're done." And again, arrogant Todd said, <laughs> "I'm going to do it because I'm not a normal individual, and I'm I've been training for this." And yeah, I got kicked out of that one. So I came back to another one, and I learned the importance of education. And I taught. I spoke with the manager. And I said, "This is what I'm doing. This is what I need to do to prep, and this is why I need to do it." And she was totally all, yeah. And if anyone gives you a problem, come talk to me. This is exciting because you're training. You're, it's, it's not all about the heat. Like I'm training my kidneys to filter 60 to 80 ounces of water as opposed to the 20 to 30 because I'm sweating out 60 to 80 ounces an hour. And you have to obviously recoup that or you will die. Uh, I'm training my stomach to not go into fight or flight. Well, my body to go in fight or flight, which always is the blood leaves your stomach first. And as a runner, or any endurance athlete, I'm sorry. If you're if you're not digesting food, you're done. Right. So I'm having to keep my body in there. I'm eating food while I'm in there, just to make sure my body is used to these conditions. I'm just I'm laughing. I'm I'm just imagining some dude that that I don't know in a sauna at 24 hour fitness, running in place or doing cardio, eating and drinking. I'd yeah. wonder what the hell was going on too right? if I didn't and, know. And just to add to that as far as the confusion of individuals that would come in at the point, almost everyone knows, you know, cause I'm doing this for all hours. They're, so at some point like, I reach out. like sauna it, cardio guys here I again. use the uh, elevation training mask, right? <laughs> so, and let's go back years ago when it was just a big gas mask and people are really freaked. Now it's a little more aesthetically pleasing <laughs> and not as scary, right. but I'd, I'd be running in that. And that's when people like would open the door and just turn right back out, you know? And it's like, <laughs> Oh man, and always it just really leads to a lot of people asking questions when, you know, because the training mass is a great tool for me to, di you know, strengthen my, my diaphragm. And it's like one of those things you warm up and you take it off and you feel like your lungs are on steroids. So it's a great tool and I use that everywhere, but I had that also because again, you're at Mount Whitney, which goes up to like 14,000 feet. 
So you're going from negative like 260 feet below up to that. So it's all training for that kind of high altitude stuff and well as- And the change in altitude too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and it happens pretty abruptly. It's right. not like an overall thing. So, um, and that's why, you know, even like in the Tahoe race where you're always at above 10,000 feet, you know, you can, you can go in there and you just want, you need to acclimate yourself to that because- right. Altitude puts almost a, a large group of people in the same level, at the same like playing level, because it doesn't matter how fit you are. You get out there and you're like, whoa, I'm out of shape, you know? And it's really not that. You're just, it's it's altitude, you know? So you mm -hmm. get these individuals that will come in these races and they're just like, whoa, okay, I'm not used to this. But then you get the guys from like Europe who live at 16,000 feet and they come down here and it's like, wow, it's like running with the oxygen mask on, you know? It's funny that yeah. we're dying, but... That's crazy. All right, Todd, where can our listeners get more of you? Yeah, um, I have a personal page. I'm not I'm not that popular. I haven't exceeded the 5,000 friends. So Todd Shipman on Facebook. Um, I do have a website, which is just yourthrivingself.com, and that you can go on there and see the kind of coaching services, the consulting that I do for people, and um, hit me up on there. Please feel free to... Uh, join the bulletproof biohacking group where that I'm an admin or even if you're interested in diet stuff you know we have the bulletproof uh, diet and support group mm -hmm. um, and those are very active and they're very supportive individuals in those group for any questions you have so I'm very active on there if you're on there for a day you'll see me posting oh, usually beautiful Todd final question top three tips to live optimal mm. I know you've kind of given a bunch already why you think on yeah that? well uh, no I, I think one thing that we we did talk about, but as far as I think the number one thing is diet, yeah, mindfulness, okay, reading. All right, reading will not just on a platform, but read a book. You get experiences. It's it's awesome. All right, beautiful, great tips. Mindfulness eating, mindfulness breathing is fine too, but mindfulness eating will change too. Todd. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. This has uh, been an awesome show. For you guys listening, go to naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to go down the rabbit hole on any of these things. We'll have links to Todd's website, the Facebook groups, uh, his Facebook page, all the articles and cool stuff that we mentioned. Make sure you share the OPP with your friends and family, people in your life who you know will benefit from what we're talking about. And please go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Those things really do help the show uh, on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen. Thanks again, Todd. This has been great. It's been an honor. Thank you, Ryan.